really, without um, uh, any further ado, um, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael, for that very kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry that I can't be there in person, but uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some early stage work. Uh, it follows along uh, things that I've been involved with uh, for some time and uh, work that I'm engaged with, with uh, regulators and policymakers around the world. Um, but this will be more of a uh, talk uh, working through some of the issues and, and my sense of where things are going, uh, as opposed to a specific paper that I'm just going to talk through. I'm actually working on an early stage paper project on this topic. The, the difficulty is that my co-author was just nominated for a senior role in the United States government. So uh, if she gets confirmed, then I no longer have a co-author, but uh, it, will be, it will be good for the country if that happens. Anyway, so the, the talk is about, uh, as you see, regulating decentralization. Uh, as Michael said, uh, some of this draws upon my book, uh, Blockchain and the New Architecture of Trust. Some of it also draws upon a project that I led recently between the Wharton School and the World Economic Forum on uh, decentralized finance, trying to articulate what the issues are for policymakers. I'll, I'll talk about a little of that here. But really, the, the question that I want to focus on is, what do we do? Uh, what uh, should be the response to blockchain-based systems that are decentralized and therefore seemingly pose a challenge for the imposition of regulation? So I want to start by going back. I'm going to, in a couple places uh, in this talk, look back at history because uh, I think it is instructive here. And as, as you heard, I've been involved in these debates about internet and technology policy for now quite some time. And I think the lessons of 20 plus years ago are important and they're also not always that well understood. So the starting point uh, I have is uh, former US President Bill Clinton in 2000 uh, was speaking about the extension of uh, trading rights to China, China's accession to the World Trade Organization. Uh, and he was saying that uh, opening up these markets and in particular opening up the internet to China will change China, it will make China more democratic because uh, inevitably that's what the internet does. Uh, and he said, well, in response to those who suggest that China will control the internet, that's not going to happen. That would be like nailing jello to the wall. Um, now, uh, I gathered uh, in, in the UK, they call what we call jello in the US jelly, but it's that, that red thing that you see there um, that you're probably familiar with. Imagine trying to nail it up to a wall it would not be terribly effective. Uh, the idea is the internet's a decentralized network. It's not something that can easily be controlled by a government. And uh, that poses this fundamental question. Is the internet regulable? Is it reasonable to think that uh, policymakers and government entities can exert their will on internet-based services? And it turns out that's not just an issue if we're asking about what an authoritarian state like China will do with regard to free expression on the internet. It's also a question of what liberal democratic states are going to do when issues come up uh, that might ra raise regulatory concerns involving internet-based services. And this was really the central thing that we all fought about for years early on in internet law and internet policy. Can the internet actually be regulated? And I'm happy to tell you, we now know the answer to that. The answer is of course, yes. Uh, it turns out, first of all, that China was able to build a great firewall, as I'm sure you all know, uh, and uh, exert very significant control over what access people in China have uh, for uh, getting uh, availability to get content over the internet. And China's entitled to do that. It is a sovereign state, and it's entitled to make laws and enforce them for its citizens on its territory. Uh, but the surprise was that China was able to do that technically uh, and uh, quite effectively. Uh, the answer was also yes, largely speaking, uh, outside of China for the question of could regulatory agencies uh, in places like the US and Europe come up with policies uh, and implement them on internet-based services. It turned out that this notion that this was a purely decentralized world where people would essentially go out of the real world into this place called cyberspace and do whatever they wanted, uh, that turned out to be a fiction. Uh, what we are seeing now with blockchain is the same debate coming back. Uh, even though it's now widely accepted 
that it is possible to regulate internet-based services, we face the same question uh, with regard to blockchain because it's a different technical architecture. Uh, and I assume I don't need to, uh, for this uh, seminar series, um, get more into the context and the details, but uh, the argument is um, a blockchain has no central point of control. Um, you cannot go and say, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, please take this transaction off of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, whoever Satoshi is or was, um, there is no entity, uh, person, organization that has that power uh, to directly uh, modify, stop, reverse uh, a transaction on the network. So we get this basic question again, how to exercise oversight over these decentralized systems? And interestingly, we also get many of the uh, surrounding questions that come into play and, and many of the, the misconceptions in the debate that happened in the early days of internet regulation. One of them is that everyone likes to pose this as a fundamental conflict between regulation and innovation. And I put both of them in quotes because uh, regulation is not one thing. It's not that systems are either regulated or not. And that if they are regulated, that there's regulation, and that means one distinctive thing. It's, it's very different if we are talking about, say, any money laundering regulation of um, certain kinds of service providers, or if we're talking about regulation for intellectual property enforcement, consumer protection regulation, lots of different issues about regulation. Um, innovation is also not just one thing. And it's also not always the case that just because a service or a provider is subject to regulation, that innovation automatically goes away. Um, there's this tendency to assume that uh, there's inherently a conflict there, when in fact, uh, in some cases, regulation can actually promote innovation. And this is an argument that uh, many people other than me have made. I, I talk about it at, at some length in the book uh, re with regard to blockchain. Uh, but the point is um, uh, services require trust, markets require trust. And one factor that can promote trust uh, is effective regulation. It does not mean that all regulation is good or regulation can be uh, problematic, but regulation uh, is not necessarily in opposition to innovation. But again, this, this debate and, and those kinds of statements, which were made a lot in the early days of the internet, it's all going to disappear if regulators come in. Uh, we're hearing that again with regard to blockchain. And then the third point is, interestingly enough, um, the structure of the debate is also similar. One of the first conflicts about this question of regulating the internet came up uh, around user-generated content. So what happens if a user of an online service, and this was uh, frankly even before Google, but Yahoo was around, uh, Amazon was around, um, what happens if a user posts something illegal or something that's libelous? Uh, is the site the publisher? Uh, because if I post something that's uh, libelous or defamatory in, and it's printed in the newspaper, the newspaper is responsible legally uh, because they are deciding to publish the information. Uh, and as you probably know, we had a big debate about this in the US, eventually wound up passing Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which essentially said the platform is not automatically liable. Uh, because that would be unreasonable. If the platform is responsible for everything that every user does, that would impose upon them a duty to check everything that gets posted. And if you have millions or eventually now billions of users around the world of some of these platforms, that's just fundamentally not feasible. Um, so we got to this equilibrium in the internet. Now the same question is coming into play because what happened as a result of that decision uh, and other decisions and the evolution of the market was these massive digital platforms like Facebook and Google and Amazon and Alibaba grew to the point where uh, they are tremendously powerful, not just because they have uh, immunity from liability, but more and more, even though the internet is decentralized, uh, power is centralized in these big platforms. So um, we don't have as much of a question of conceivably, could they be regulated? We are now fighting more about, um, are they regulated and should they be regulated? Uh, and there's an emerging consensus that these platforms should be regulated much more than they have been to date. Interesting thing about blockchain is now we may be going back. So the essential notion of the, the Web 3.0 movement is that these centralized digital platforms will give way increasingly to decentralized systems that are based on blockchain and smart contracts 
mediated by token economies, uh, and that um, users will be in control again, that there will no longer be this aggregation of power in the intermediaries. Um, but notice what that does. That brings back uh, into play this question about who's responsible. So are users responsible for what they do? Yes. Um, but if users do things that are illegal or contrary to regulatory obligations, what does that mean about the platform? And the answer that says, well, the platform is something different. We can regulate the platform separate from regulating the user activity, which is where we got to on the web. That may not make sense as much in the blockchain context where there's not this division necessarily between the users and the platform. What I would like to suggest to you is that um, we should start to think about this by uh, talking about what regulation really is and, and what's really challenging and important about regulation. Um, we usually start by talking about the what. What's, what's the thing that is being regulated? It, it, is this a security that is subject to a certain set of rules in the US under the 33 and 34 Securities Acts and, and similar kinds of rules in other places? Um, and what I'd suggest to you is that's important, but really uh, the regulatory challenge conceptually is about three other questions. One is who? Uh, it doesn't matter in the abstract what a thing is. Uh, it matters who is trying to do something with that thing in what context. So if we say that a certain asset is a security under the law, um, then it becomes a question about transacting that security. Are you an exchange that is trying to make a market in that security? Um, what are the rules? Do you have to have a broker dealer intermediating that transaction? Uh, can that security be sent to certain users who are in other countries and so forth? So the who is actually really quite critical. The where, of course, is also extremely critical uh, because uh, law is made by states. Uh, and therefore, the question of where the users are and where the transaction exists uh, will determine the question of how regulation can and should apply. This was also an area where we thought it would be very hard on the internet because where's the web? It's nowhere. Um, it turns out that there were practical ways in most cases for internet-based services um, to uh, allocate uh, to regulatory jurisdictions and impose rules. Any of these things I can get into more in the Q&A if you want. Uh, but the where is the third question. The fourth question is the how. And the how is the enforcement question. Can the rules be enforced? Even if we agree on what the rules should be uh, and who and where and what they should apply to, uh, is it feasible to impose regulation? So these are basically the questions that we have, and I'll come back to them uh, in the blockchain context. Um, but first, I just want to talk about where this is and isn't a problem. Because the intuition most people have is that blockchain is decentralized, as I said. There's no controlling entity. And so therefore, immediately, we're going to have this challenge that it all can't be regulated. And it turns out that in most cases to date, the challenge is not that bad. Because even though blockchains themselves are inherently decentralized in some way, now, of course, uh, as you know, it depends on the architecture of the blockchain. There are many different kinds of technical trade-offs that could be made about how decentralized it is. But fundamentally, if it's especially, a, let's say, permissionless public blockchain, there is a degree of decentralization that is inherently present there. But if we're talking about markets and activities around blockchain, where the significant financial activity is, where the significant concentrations of users are, much of that actually is still intermediated. So I put up here this picture uh, of a bunch of women popping champagne. Uh, they're doing that because they work at Coinbase. And Coinbase, which is one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges, went public earlier this year at a valuation of about 80 billion US dollars. Coinbase is an exchange. Coinbase is a centralized intermediary. Coinbase takes custody over user keys for transacting in crypto. So technically, it's quite different from the New York Stock Exchange. Um, but operationally, it functions very similarly. It's an intermediary. Um, and Coinbase can be found. Coinbase has a CEO. Coinbase has a corporation. Coinbase is subject to regulation. Now, there's lots of questions about how to do that regulation, what set of categories should apply, and so forth. Uh, but there's no fundamental challenge for regulators to engage with the Coinbases of the world. And the reality is, when you look around at the vast bulk of the blockchain activity, at least the legitimate activity, the stuff that is not entirely uh, criminal activity that is fundamentally all about uh, avoiding legal responsibility. Um, if you look at uh, everything other than that, um, the vast majority of the activity today 
still goes through some entity that can be found and can be engaged with for regulation, but not necessarily as we go into the future. And this is really what I want to focus on. Uh, one of the most significant developments of the last two years in blockchain has been the rise of decentralized finance or DeFi. Uh, and you see here a definition of DeFi. This comes from this DeFi policymaker uh, toolkit that I talked about earlier that we did with the World Economic Forum. Um, you, can, you can Google it pretty easily and, and look up that report. There's two reports. One is the toolkit, which goes through the policy and regulatory issues. One is called DeFi Beyond the Hype, which is a more general introduction to DeFi. And we define DeFi as having four elements. It's financial services, uh, trust minimized operation and settlement, uh, uh, runs on blockchain rails as opposed to traditional financial rails. Um, that's the, the core decentralization. Uh, but more than that, non-custodial services. So there is no Coinbase that holds your keys. There might be an entity, uh, there might be a website, there might be some developers, uh, but fundamentally uh, it is smart contracts that are mediating the transactions. So that all of a sudden is a uh, substantial new degree of decentralization above and beyond these existing blockchain services. And then the fourth one there, you see programmable, open and composable, open source software running on these decentralized blockchain networks uh, with interfaces that allow it to be programmed and configured in different ways and that integrate together. So services can be plugged into each other in new ways very easily. So what this means is we shift from the structure on the left, which uh, could be a traditional exchange, or it could be a crypto exchange like uh, a Coinbase uh, or a Binance, um, where there there's something in the middle. And there are all these discrete actors that are in the process. Uh, and there's an easy interface to the compliance and governance process. We move from that to the DeFi example. And this is uh, a decentralized exchange, uh, something like an automated market maker, like a Uniswap. Uh, but uh, we have a similar set of diagrams for other DeFi services. Um, there are DeFi lending services like Aave and Compound, where uh, users can provide collateral and other users can, uh, uh, you know, the users provide liquidity and then other users can put up collateral uh, and take out loans using that liquidity. Uh, there are DeFi derivative services uh, like DYDX. Uh, there are asset management services. There are insurance services. Uh, and there are stable coins, um, decentralized DeFi stable coins like MakerDAO, um, all of which um, have a broadly similar architecture here. What's in the middle is a set of smart contracts. It's just code running on a blockchain. Now, someone's writing those, those smart contracts, um, but ultimately, once the smart contracts are operating on the blockchain, they operate uh, immutably. And many of the other roles that traditionally were filled by discrete actors, by humans, get filled by uh, decentralized computer-based systems like oracles that provide price feeds and other information. Um, the liquidity process is decentralized through smart contracts. Again, there are still people who would provide that capital, um, but they are just providing it again through a smart contract interface in the same way as the people who are trading and using the network on the other side. Uh, and as you probably know, there's been a tremendous uptake in DeFi activity since roughly summer of 2020. I start this chart in December 17. That's when MakerDAO launched. So that's when the first DeFi service, major service was uh, in existence. And as you see, it took several years before DeFi took off, uh, but it has tremendously uh, over the last year and a half uh, leveled off some um, uh, last summer. But as you see, it's continued to be strong with uh, now somewhere close to 100 billion US dollars um, of assets digital assets, cryptocurrencies that are locked into DeFi platforms. Uh, OK, so that's exciting. Uh, but that also poses very serious challenges. Uh, and we have already seen significant harms and dangers and risks of DeFi, problems of scams uh, and uh, investor protection concerns where um, the users of these systems don't have access to the same kinds of disclosures. Uh, and there isn't the same kind of regulatory oversight that there is in traditional financial markets. Um, very large hacks and exploits um, because um, these platforms in many cases are not entirely ready for prime time. The security of the smart contracts and even of the underlying blockchain layers is not robust anywhere near the level that we would expect for traditional financial services um, and other kinds of problems with maturity of the systems interfaces that are difficult uh, and significant outages 
um, because of problems um, with these systems as they scale up. So we have a whole series of challenges here, as one might expect, when there are large sums of money being transacted. Anytime that has happened throughout history, um, those markets have run into problems, and that's why we have financial regulation. And again, I'm talking here in general terms. Uh, we can debate what the right structures are of regulation, um, but there has never been a uh, fully unregulated, large-scale financial market um, that has not uh, led to these kinds of problems and typically has not had severe boom and bust cycles um, and, and major crashes. Um, in the DeFi uh, Policymaker Toolkit, we break out a whole series of these risks. These are areas of concern for policymakers. Uh, and these are not concerns per se about the fact that DeFi is decentralized. These are concerns about the activities going on. Um, and I won't go through this in, in great detail, but um, some of these are familiar kinds of risks. The, the financial risk you see there are, are risks in any kind of financial transaction system. Uh, market risk is the price may go down, and that may cause you to lose your entire position if you are leveraged, and it might have other kinds of spillover effects. Um, so that's a, that's a risk in DeFi, but that's a risk that we know about. There are some risks that DeFi may uh, ameliorate or actually uh, make uh, insignificant. One of these is counterparty risk. In traditional financial transactions, you have to, um, you don't know for sure that the party you're doing business with has the funds that they say they have. Well, on a blockchain, you can verify and you can lock those assets through a smart contract um, in a way that you couldn't do with traditional kinds of financial arrangements. So some risks actually make it better. Uh, but many other risks get worse, and many other risks come about in DeFi that are not traditional kinds of risks. So again, we have this whole set of new technical risks, uh, and uh, smart contract engineering is getting better. Smart contract auditors, auditing is getting better. The security and scalability of blockchains is getting better, uh, but it is still very, very immature given the volume of financial activity happening. And then there are all these new kinds of risks. Um, the oracles, again, are this critical informational feed into the system, um, but they are not a blockchain. Um, they can be decentralized, but there have been a number of cases where the oracles get attacked in a way uh, that then allows a significant attack on the financial transactions on the DeFi platform. Um, the minor risks are another really interesting one. There's been an exploding area of what's called MEV, minor or maximal extractable value, where it turns out that the miners um, of the blockchain can reorder transactions uh, in a way that, for example, they can put their own transaction ahead of a transaction they see coming and profit, essentially take a share of the profits off that transaction for themselves. Um, and these are the miners. These are not participants directly in the uh, smart contract uh, application. Uh, in the DAP, the, the DeFi platform, um, they're the miners of the underlying blockchain. And so that's opened up a huge question about, is this an attack? Is this just a part of security? And it just needs to be in some better equilibrium. But we have nothing like this to think about in traditional finance. Um, because the you know there is nothing like miners, the, these actors who secure the underlying blockchain outside of the financial application itself. Uh, operational issues, uh, these systems have decentralized governance, and that raises a whole host of challenges in practice. Um, legal compliance, um, are, again, are familiar challenges uh, in terms of financial crime, interdiction, uh, fraud, and so forth. Uh, but uh, as I'll talk about, these become particularly significant challenges where the platform, as in the DeFi case, is decentralized. And then we have these emergent risks, these, these systemic risks. Again, because of these are composable systems, um, the possibility is quite high for um, risks that are greater than anyone appreciates. Um, as we saw in the 2008 financial crisis, um, systemic risks can be quite large and uh, when um, they uh, are not sufficiently appreciated and there are not, there's not sufficient robustness brought into the system, um, that can lead to a catastrophe. So we have this whole set of risks. Uh, and the basic challenge that we face is this decentralization challenge uh, that relates to all four of the aspects of regulation I talked about. So the what is actually a problem here. Uh, I suggested earlier that the what was not as much of a problem, but the issue with the what is that the same DeFi platform 
can transact in many different kinds of assets. So in the US, we have um, a fragmented financial regulatory system. We have a different spot market regulator, the SEC, from the commodities and uh, futures market regulator, the derivatives regulator, the CFTC. Uh, in the UK, that would still both be under the FCA. Uh, but there still are differences in terms of how regulation deals with those two kinds of markets. Um, the same exchange that's trading stocks is probably not trading artwork, uh, for example. Um, but in a DeFi environment, these are just tokens. Uh, these are just smart contracts. The same platforms can operate across many different asset categories. That's a, a big challenge for the way regulation is set up. The who is even a bigger challenge because these systems are diffuse. And in particular, because the governance is diffuse. Uh, more and more of these DeFi systems use token-based on-chain governance systems, where ultimately the power to determine uh, not just uh, whether a transaction can go through, uh, but for example, what's the interest rate? What's the policy uh, around activity on this platform? Um, there is no one entity that just becomes something that is uh, delegated to token holders um, who vote through their tokens. So the who then becomes a challenge. The where becomes a big challenge. These are fundamentally global networks. They are not networks that operate in any one country. Um, and they're not even in a particular data center in one country. Um, they're on the blockchain, wherever that is. And then the how. Um, enforcement becomes a challenge when these systems are designed to be decentralized because that's censorship resistance. Uh, you cannot shut down the Bitcoin network without shutting down a huge percentage of the nodes. Um, and that becomes then a challenge if you want to impose some regulatory obligation on those networks. What I'd like to say to you, though, is it's not quite so bad. And I think we are going to get to the same kind of answer that we got to with the internet, which is not to say these questions are simple or, or that all these questions can be solved, but there is not some set of activities that may not effectively be regulated. But in general, we have reached an equilibrium where regulation is possible. Again, I'm putting aside the, the digital platform question about whether there has been the political willpower to impose regulation before these platforms get so big that the, the political economy and their, and their power is so enormous. Uh, again, that's not a question about whether it's possible to pass a law that affects Facebook. Um, the basic question about can we regulate internet-based services, again, I would suggest has been answered largely in the affirmative. And I think we'll get there with blockchain as well. Um, and I'd like to make this argument by going back and looking at history. I, I've talked to you some about um, Section 230 um, and um, the, the, the Bill Clinton statement and China and the internet. But what I wanna focus on is a different story, which is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, um, the most prominent uh, company was Napster, was really the first time where this question of how to regulate decentralized internet services uh, became a significant challenge. Napster was a platform uh, that allowed people to share music. Um, so it's very clear that if I buy uh, some music, I buy an album, I buy some songs, that's subject to copyright. Uh, and I can't just copy that and give it away to someone else for free. Um, I need to pay the copyright holder, the rights holder to get access to the content. Uh, that's very clear under intellectual property law. Um, but what Napster did was created a system that would allow me to see the music that everyone else in the network had on their computer uh, and transfer it to my computer. Um, and this was very clearly copyright infringement when it was being used for copyrighted material. Uh, you could use the same system to transfer public domain material, but obviously what most people were doing was using it to get free music. Uh, and the challenge was the decentralization challenge. If Napster had set up a website if it was uh, Amazon saying, you get all this music for free off of our servers, there would be no problem saying Amazon is engaged in rampant copyright infringement. Uh, but Napster was not a website. Napster was software that people ran on their computers that connected to each other. Um, and so the concern was this is going to totally destroy um, these content industries because they won't be able to make any money because their decentralized system cannot be regulated. So what happened was interesting. What happened was it turned out that there are throughout the process, depending on uh, or really regardless uh, of technically how these systems are designed, countervailing forces um, that allowed for a viable regulatory equilibrium. So first step was Napster. Napster gets sued by the recording industry. Uh, the case uh, a and Napster eventually decided by the US Supreme Court, Supreme Court in 2001, Napster loses. Why does Napster lose? Napster loses because it's not really decentralized. 
Napster maintained centrally a directory of all the music uh, at any moment on their system. Napster had services that were maintaining that directory. Napster wasn't actually holding the music. The content was still on users' uh, machines. But Napster actually had a strong point of central control. Napster could block content out of that directory. Napster could see exactly what was being transferred and could see that its system was being used to transfer uh, copyrighted material. And Napster was a company that was operating a business that maintained that uh, central directory as well as distributed the software. Um, so Napster gets sued successfully for contributory copyright infringement and ultimately shut down. Uh, Napster was uh, what we would now sometimes call a, a dyno, decentralized in name only. Not really decentralized. Uh, fast forward to the present. It turns out that we see a lot of this in the blockchain context as well. Uh, I talked about the Coinbase example where Coinbase doesn't really purport to be decentralized, but the, the uh, trading is actually more centralized than it seems. Uh, but we see this with DeFi as well um, and with uh, DeFi-like things. So a few years ago, there was uh, a case called Ether Delta. The SEC sanctioned a decentralized exchange, uh, a, an early DeFi exchange, because it was trading unregistered securities, uh, crypto tokens that, that were uh, classified as securities under US law without registration. Uh, and even though uh, Ether Delta was decentralized, uh, it was not custodial. Um, it still maintained an order book. It still distributed software. The uh, author of the Ether Delta software still had many ways of exercising control over those transactions. And he could be found, uh, and the SEC sanctioned him and, and forced Ether Delta um, to uh, change its operations, and I believe ultimately to shut down. Uh, more recently, there was something called DMN, DeFi Money Market, um, also sanctioned by the SEC. Um, DeFi money market actually was neither DeFi nor money market. It was basically describing itself as a DeFi lending platform, uh, but it turned out it was actually quite centralized. and was actually quite fraudulent. It was not actually doing what it was saying. It was just stealing people's money. But again, it, it was claiming to be DeFi using the language of these DeFi services. Um, so the first thing that we will see and we do see is things that either are not really decentralized at all or actually not as decentralized as we think. What happened after Napster? Well, what happened after Napster got shut down or when Napster looked like it was going to be shut down was other platforms came into being that actually were more significantly decentralized. The most prominent was Kazaa, um, the, the case that ultimately got brought, you see there, uh, MGM via Grokster, um, was called Grokster because uh, G comes before K in the alphabet, so it was the first name in the, uh, in the heading. Uh, but there were several of these platforms, and they got rid of the central directory that Napster had. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer, um, nodes on the network, you would uh, join the network with this software, it would just find other nodes in the network uh, and then build uh, directories uh, in a decentralized way. So Kazan and Groxer said, okay, we don't control anything. We don't have a directory we maintain. We can't block it. We can't even see. We don't know exactly what files are going over our network. They get sued, 2005 Supreme Court case comes down, they lose similar to Napster, they get shut down. Why? Even though these systems were technically decentralized, they still had operators, they had developers who were building software, who were monetizing that software, who understood exactly what was going on. They might not have seen each individual file going over the network, but they fully understood and they built this system and optimized it for trading um, illicit infringing copyrighted material. Um, the court eventually developed this theory called inducement that says essentially, um, you are facilitating and encouraging these kinds of illicit transactions with some general knowledge of what's going on. Now, what's the al analog in DeFi? Well, it's interesting in the DeFi case that the platforms that have developed um, are not waiting for this kind of legal action to shut them down. Um, so there have been two really interesting developments in recent months. One of them was Uniswap. Um, Uniswap lets you put up uh, liquidity in any two tokens and basically swap any two tokens in a decentralized way, uh, non-custodial. Um, one kind of thing that people started trading on Uniswap were synthetic stocks, tokens that represent a stock. So there are many people around the world who do not have access to US capital markets, for example, so they cannot trade Facebook stock legally. But I can create a token that exactly tracks the price of Facebook stock. Um, and then put that up and trade that uh, on a platform like Uniswap. Technically, I can do that. 
um, securities regulators have made clear that that would be a serious and clear violation of securities laws. So what did Uniswap do? Uniswap on the Uniswap.com site, the, the major general interface to Uniswap, blocked, they blacklisted the synthetic stocks. Now, you can still go through um, the smart contract interface if you know what you're doing and get access to the platform that doesn't go through that block. Uh, but most uh, DeFi users um, uh, are going through this uh, visible interface, through this intermediation. They are not available now to uh, be able to trade those synthetic stocks. So this is a, a case of, even though Uniswap is decentralized, um, the developers and the company that is facilitating that platform um, realizes that they are going to need to take some action to limit what's happening on the platform. Second example is Aave Arc. Aave, again, is a DeFi lending platform. One of the big challenges with DeFi lending um, is identity. Um, there are know your customer requirements for any money laundering and financial crime interdiction and terrorist financing uh, prohibitions on most financial services providers around the world. Uh, but as you know, a blockchain uh, does not have human readable identity built into it. It's just based on um, addresses on the blockchain. Um, so this uh, is a big concern that regulators have. We don't know that you are transacting with legitimate actors. Um, Aave has this problem, again, because it's just allowing lending uh, between any two blockchain addresses. Um, Aave has proactively, though, set up a separate segment of their platform that requires know your customer checks, that in order to get into these lending pools, um, you need to be identified and verified uh, through this KYC process. Why? Because they see that the big opportunity here is not just existing digital asset holders, uh, people who are active crypto users. The big opportunity are the trillions and trillions of dollars in the traditional financial system, the institutions. And those institutions are regulated. Those institutions are not able to and do not want to interact in an environment where these uh, regulations and requirements are not adhered to. Um, so again, uh, we start to see now early signs that the DeFi platforms are realizing that despite all the rhetoric, we are decentralized and that is important, which, which is real, um, they're going to take some steps to address and work with regulators on those concerns. Third thing you see there is BitTorrent. Um, BitTorrent is the most decentralized example of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. BitTorrent was set up around the same time as Napster. BitTorrent was optimized for sharing video files, especially in the early days when uh, there was not significant bandwidth uh, on internet services. Um, and BitTorrent um, is the most massive copyright infringement in the history of the world. BitTorrent at one point was 70% of all traffic on the global internet. And the vast majority of it was people sharing video files that they were not entitled to share. BitTorrent was never sued, though. BitTorrent was never shut down. Why? Because it was actually decentralized. It was open source software provided on the network. There was no bit, there is a BitTorrent Inc. or there was a BitTorrent Inc. Um, but it did not engage in any of these actions like Napster and Kazaa did to facilitate illicit action. In fact, it set up a business that it sold to enterprises that said, we will use this same technology but in a limited, controlled, restricted way um, with uh, copyright enforcement for you to provide your own services to your customers. Um, now, the problem there was that dramatically limited BitTorrent's market opportunity. Uh, and it turns out that the BitTorrent company was never particularly successful, even though, again, the BitTorrent uh, protocol was extraordinarily successful. Um, and ironically, the BitTorrent company ultimately got acquired by Tron, a, a somewhat shady blockchain based on the name and the notoriety. So there's a countervailing force here as well, that the system that is the most decentralized is not necessarily going to get the most adoption and the most financial activity around it. Again, who cares the most about a system that is untrackable? Um, sure, there are many people who ideologically want that. There are some uh, dissidents and so forth, uh, but it's the people engaged in illicit activity who care the most. For them, that is the absolute essential thing um, about these systems. Um, and that is a limited market, and that is a market where regulators have other ways of going after it. So ultimately, the question that we face is how to find the proper equilibrium. That there are different degrees of decentralization, um, but there are forces that limit that decentralization. And there are reasons that providers will want to find a happy medium on the level of decentralization as well. And it turns out that this actually has already entered into the regulatory debate. Three years ago, Bill Hinman, who was a senior official at the time at the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US, talked about a test 
for whether a digital asset was a security. And again, this is specific to US securities laws and the Howey test and so forth, uh, but really is actually a more general proposition, I would suggest, that, that, that is worth picking up on in these debates. Um, and his point was that if we are concerned, for example, about uh, securities being investments, um, that someone is going to provide this security or this investment contract or this collective investment scheme um, to make money, um, that we are concerned that they are going to take advantage of investors uh, in that system. If, on the other hand, we're talking about something that is inherently decentralized, if we're talking about Bitcoin, again, there's no Bitcoin Inc. that is providing something to investors where, where investors might be taken advantage of. Apologize for the, the phone in the background there. Um, and so he suggested this. It was significantly criticized, but I think there is something there. Uh, the problem is we don't yet have good tests and good ways of assessing what is the level of decentralization of a system that we should measure and, and what is an appropriate and uh, sufficient level of decentralization. Sorry about that. I don't know, of course, Murphy's Law that this came up right as I was here. Okay. Um, all right. So just a little more. I know uh, I, I want to leave you some time for Q&A. Uh, Bill Heyman, uh, interestingly enough, uh, is now at uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, working uh, on their crypto team. Um, but there is, as I've suggested, um, reasons for thinking that um, this decentralization challenge can be addressed. Um, first is users generally don't care. Um, some users do. Um, they're libertarians. Most users want the most convenient service. Most developers, even if they do care about decentralization, want a system that is going to grow and scale. And there are technical reasons at times to uh, centralize more for scaling. And there are market reasons in terms of user experience and so forth to do that. Again, that's what we've seen with things like Uniswap and Aave. Um, the other point is that systems are not always decentralized at the same uh, level. So typically when a, uh, say a DeFi platform is established, there is a development team. They issue a token, they upload smart contracts and so forth. Um, the system is more centralized at the time. Now, these DeFi platforms often become more decentralized. Um, they, uh, for example, delegate the governance to tokens and so forth. They may actually dissolve the foundation that operates them. Um, but there is a point in time early on where it is easier to think about what the entity is um, and to have that regulatory engagement. This is something I think that the European Union has tried to get to with its MECA rules for uh, digital assets with a set of rules around issuance of tokens. Now, now, the harder question there is what to do retroactively where we have these tokens that have already been issued um, that have large uh, amounts of activity. Uh, but I think that that makes some sense in terms of focusing on that mode of motion, um, moment of issuance as an important point. And then the final reason that this is not such a bad problem is that DeFi doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, bridges and gateways from and to the traditional financial system are critical. Um, the most important enabler for this massive explosion of DeFi is stable coins. And even though stable coins like uh, MakerDAO are decentralized, the vast majority of stable coin activity is stable coins like Tether and USDC, which are centralized. Uh, and even MakerDAO, a very significant percentage, I think last I saw 30% of the collateral in MakerDAO is USDC, is a centralized stablecoin. Um, so those are hooks. Those are points of regulatory engagement. Um, ultimately, what regulators care about is the why. Why are you doing something? Uh, and as I said, in the case of Napster and Grokster, it was clear they understood they were facilitating file sharing. Um, and this is the piece that people often don't understand about regulation. You don't just look at the rules and mechanically apply them. Um, I put there a link to an article that I co-wrote um, where the issue was, well, if you can store data on the Bitcoin blockchain, which you can, each node can actually store some information, uh, people um, encoded the, um, uh, the, the digital representation of uh, child pornography files uh, in a, a Bitcoin transaction. So it was actually sitting there at all of the thousands of nodes on the Bitcoin network. And the argument was, okay, they're all guilty of possessing child pornography, which is illegal. Uh, and the argument we made was, no, that's not really how it works. Uh, no regulator is going to sue to shut down a Bitcoin node or a miner because in theory on this, um, you know, this set of code and this set of data that they um, are maintaining, there is something that someone could go in and find represents a child pornography image. That's not actually what they're doing. And in fact, none of them have gotten shut down this way uh, as a result. Um, so what do we know about DeFi? Well, not as much as we should. Um, we do know that there is some chunk of it that is clearly illicit activity. 
Um, so Shapeshift, which was a um, early sort of DeFi-ish platform for trading tokens, um, was forced by regulators to impose know your customer checks. They say they lost 99% of their volume as a result. Um, that would suggest that there are reasons why those who were transacting did not want uh, identity about who they were. They did not want to comply. The other interesting fact is that when we look at most of the DeFi activity, it's not the retail activity that most people focus on. It's actually institutional. It's large volume transactions by players who either are already traditional regulated institutions or are sophisticated, savvy players in financial markets who have a lot of capital at stake. Um, so ultimately, then just to wrap up, as I want to make sure to have some time for your questions, um, four recommendations for regulators. Um, one is there are bad actors here. There are entities that very clearly are engaged in regulatory arbitrage um, and efforts to avoid compliance. Um, the how question is challenging because they are global. It requires uh, international coordination, as I say there on the last bullet point. Uh, but there has not, I think, been enough serious coordinated regulatory action um, to shut down those providers that um, very clearly understand um, that they are acting in violation of the law. On the other hand, there need to be incentives for the good actors, um, for the entities that want to comply. They want to be decentralized um, and they see value in that. Um, but they want to, again, integrate with the traditional financial system. Um, and so um, this, again, is things like the Aave and Uniswap steps, I think, are good steps in the right direction. There needs to be further engagement. And the big piece that regulators have not done well enough is provide clearer guidance on what is sufficient decentralization, what is good enough to address the concerns that regulators have, even if it's not the same thing that traditional financial systems do. And then we need mechanisms like safe harbors, um, and uh, sandboxes and so forth, um, and oversight and um, investigation into technical mechanisms. There are ways to make these problems less severe, um, but uh, in some cases we need time and there needs to be dialogue between the policymakers and the developers to figure out how to implement them. So with that, let me stop. Um, the last thing I just wanna say briefly is um, the punchline with digital music is, well, who won in the end? It wasn't any of the decentralized players. It was Apple with iTunes, and then ultimately companies like Spotify, which are completely centralized. Um, why? Because they provided a great user experience. Uh, and ultimately, what matters in the growth of markets is trust. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, trust is something that can be facilitated by healthy engagement with regulators and policymakers. Uh, and ultimately, I think that's the direction we have to strive for in these new DeFi and blockchain markets as well. Not systems that are perfectly controlled or perfectly uncontrolled, um, but systems that are both trustworthy and trusted. So with that, I would say thank you very much for your time. Let me stop the share here and uh, happy to take uh, a few questions. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin, um, for a very insightful and, and thought-provoking uh, presentation. And uh, I have a few questions myself, but uh, let's start with the uh, audience. Um, JP, please go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Um, hi, Kevin. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I have a question about uh, the notion of intermediary, which is really key to, to, to this yeah. whole debate in regulation. Um, there's been uh, uh, discussions recently about whether uh, miners in a blockchain should be considered intermediaries, and if so, mm -hmm. under what grounds? What do you think of this particular issue? Uh, why is it so critical? And should we consider miners or, or other types of network validators to be external to the organization and, and potentially intermediaries, or are they actually part of Bitcoin or Ethereum? Uh, and in which case they are not intermediaries, they are just mm -hmm. insiders. Um, so we need to break that down more. So Angela Walsh and others have argued that we should think of miners as fiduciaries and they have a, a legal duty vis-a-vis -vis the blockchain. I, I don't think that's the right direction to go because I, I think the, the, the fiduciary law doesn't, doesn't really match up uh, as well with what's going on. Um, and it's too broad. Um, so what we need to ask is intermediary for what? And, and that's why I talked a little bit about the, the minor extractable value. Um, if we are simply saying a miner uh, processes transactions and has no visibility or insight or incentives vis-a-vis -vis what those transactions are, that's how we traditionally think about miners, um, then we don't really need to worry about them as much as intermediaries or things that get regulated with regard to the application functionality. Uh, but if, as is now happening in DeFi, uh, miners care very much about the transactions and they are competing very explicitly to extract value from those transactions, 
um, then it doesn't make sense to say, well, they're minors, they're at a different level, they have nothing to do with this. Um, and, and so that, you know, I, I think once we break down the question and say, well, when we say intermediary, intermediary in what? And again, you know, going back to those questions, um, you know, wh why, why do we care? What is the problem that we are concerned about? Um, I think we'll get different answers in different contexts, but, but certainly there are situations, and, and this is what the, the MEV debate is bringing up, um, where, where minors very clearly are playing a role um, and where they shouldn't be completely off the table because they're at a different layer of the stack. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, first one from uh, Alexandra. Uh, Alexandra, do you want to uh, ask in person, so to speak, or do you want me to read your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I see. I see the question there. So yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll respond to it. Now, Alexander, tell me if I if I address it well. So, well, so but you know, banks' risk appetite is defined by regulators, right? I mean, you know, the regulators will set the capital reserve requirements, and that will you know, and then what what kinds of um, uh, you know assets banks can hold. Um, you know, the, the incentive of um, banks is to take more risk, uh, just because that's how you maximize returns. Um, so, so the risk tolerance again. You you can't think about it um, distinct from regulation. And, and really, what what I'm getting to is that um, one of the things that has warped the market to date is that regulation regulators have been too cautious about preventing banks from engaging in this market. And so that, in some cases, is what has led some of the blockchain players to say, "Well, we need capital. We need liquidity." We're going to find it in other ways that are much worse than banks in terms of the kinds of protection. So that, that's why you get some of these stable coins like Tether engaging in, in what, what to me looks like you know, very significant fraudulent activity um, because th there's a demand for a service and it's not available from regulated entities. So that's what I'm saying. The, the, in, the, the incentive process is for regulators to say, OK, what, what are we concerned about? Are we concerned about banks taking on too much risk? Are we concerned about you know, financial crime or, you know, and so, and, and how do we design a system that addresses that um, on both sides? Uh, you know, that's both um, new kinds of blockchain crypto entities that serve the role as banks. What are the requirements for them? They, they may not need to be licensed as banks under a traditional set of rules, but they're going to need to have things like reserve requirements um, that are appropriate for the kind of risk that they entail. And then um, what allows the banks the opportunity, if they wish, if they have sufficient risk appetite, to engage in that market? Um, and, and, and I have no doubt that you know, there will be enough banks, if, if they get the go-ahead signal, um, that will, uh, again, because you know, they, they, they are attracted to returns and, and risk goes along with that. OK. And uh, Kevin, would you like to take the next? Yeah, I'm looking through it's it. A, it's a long question. I guess. Lisa, do you want do you want to give me a short version of that question? Or? I see who should conduct KYC CDD, but um, yeah. So I, I, it's just really about the the terror, you know, the money laundering and terrorist financing. Yeah. So um, well, I guess I'll say this and, and tell me if this answers your question. Uh, so so that's really what I alluded to in the, at the end about the technical solutions. Um, so. Uh, you know, ultimately, the, the, the question is, uh, how is it possible to monitor and interdict um, illicit transactions? You know, I'm, I'm lumping together the, the different kinds of things that fall in that category. And of course, it, it varies some, um, you know, so for some countries that's evading capital controls. Uh, for the U.S., there are certain entities that we sanction. Other countries don't sanction those countries, um, money laundering and so forth. Um, so. One opportunity that we have is you can look at the blockchain, and that's imperfect. Um, but we've seen uh, great advances in blockchain analytics to be able to trace activity, uh, illicit activity, in ways that we simply cannot do in the traditional financial system. There, there's no record of the cash at all, uh, but there is a record of the transactions on the blockchain. Um, how effective that is and what kinds of steps by the providers are necessary to make that sufficiently effective is an open question. Um, it also is possible to build in mechanisms. There's been a lot of work that has gone on between the, the uh, virtual asset service providers, the exchanges and others around the world, um, for example, to create uh, essentially a messaging network 
um, that would allow transmission of some of the, the kind of travel rule information that, that's generally required for um, any money laundering um, in a blockchain context. Um, but it's, you know, it's an ongoing process and, and there has not yet been enough of a loop between those development, that development work, and then the rules that have been set up, because the rules, like the FATF rules, have already been proposed, um, you know, whether they actually work and whether they, you know, they can be adjusted uh, with regard to what's technically possible. And, and again, there's this magnitude question, uh, how, what is actually happening, which is, which is a question that we can get data on. You know, to what extent is um, you know this this activity we should be concerned about, and to what extent is the activity that is money laundering something that cannot be sufficiently policed through other mechanisms? Um, so again, that's not a perfect solution, but we don't have a perfect solution for uh, financial crime in the traditional financial system either. Um, and so, so again, we we need to have. I mean, there are channels for these conversations, um, but. Uh, the attitude, unfortunately, of some regulators has been, well, you know, this is, you know, we need to stop this. Um, and I think that's not always helpful. It's, it's, you know, here's the problem we need to solve. And you as an industry need to show us that you are contributing to solving that problem. And let's sit down and talk about that. Um, and, and again, that's what I'm talking about, you know, the positive incentive. Um, and so, no, I, I'm by no means saying this is easy. But, but again, the, you know, it goes back to the, um, the Napster and Kazan and, and BitTorrent example, there will always be entities that are um, you know, black market activities uh, trying to exist in the shadows and violate the rules. Um, but but that's not where the capital is going to flow. Uh, again, all of the, the uh, entities that, that have the control over the institutional capital are going to want things where they get a green light. Um, what regulators have not done enough of is say, here's something you can have a green light to because then that will incentivize a lot more activity in that direction. Thank you. Uh, right, any other questions? No, we've run if, a little bit after the hour because I, uh, I went long. Um, but uh, can we do you mind if I, if I uh, ask you uh, sure. a, a question that is sort of uh, bothering me a little bit? Um, yeah, you, you say that, um, uh, in order to attract uh, traffic, to attract investment and, and business, uh, people need to trust uh, also, uh, have tr need to have trust in, in, uh, in the uh, DeFi ecosystem. And um, this is uh, echoed as well when, when uh, you know, when, when I spoke to actors in, 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 that, um, in that environment. Um, what, what sort of bothers me slightly um, is that uh, currently, um, there seems to be a lack of trust in the traditional financial system. Um, you know, if, if you look at the traditional financial system, then it's essentially uh, state-sponsored, uh, mm -hmm. state-backed. Um, money is channeled um, to uh, the owners of assets, the owners of property mm -hmm. uh, benefit nicely also, uh, you know, after the global financial crisis. Uh, now again, um, after COVID-19. So if you have property, you're really well off. If you want to buy right. a property, you are, uh, you know, yeah. you're not so, um, so well situated. So, so I think um, despite the regulation that we have in the traditional financial system, mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of, oh, you know, in certain segments of society, there's not oh, yeah. enough trust there. And um, the whole, um, you know, at least in terms of speculation, we can speculate that Bitcoin in 2009 was sort of a reaction um, also as an alternative, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can read that into that, that uh, you know, the yeah. first uh, block and, and so on. And uh, it, it seems now that, uh, again, at least in some segments, uh, DeFi is um, uh, presented as an alternative financial system yeah. that is as greater transparency, um, that is more inclusive, uh, and so on. So, and I, I guess we can agree on the need for certain regulation of DeFi. As you said, there's no free market anyway. You know, uh, even uh, traditional free markets, you, you need to at least identify and protect property rights and, and things like that. So I wonder what your thoughts are on mm -hmm. uh, how regulating DeFi could ensure that DeFi remains a proper alternative mm -hmm. with greater transparency, more inclusivity, a, a proper alternative to the traditional financial system and does not just become yep. um, part of the traditional financial system and is occupied by big players, by the traditional banks 
or um, big tech platforms that yep. you know operate on the banking license and so on. So how yep. can we fashion the regulation in a way that it remains a, or, or becomes a true alternative also for for retail uh, finance? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's a good question. So so there's a version of that question, which is not the one you asked, but I just want to highlight it because I, I hear it a lot, which um, is not as helpful, um, which is uh, really a kind of whataboutism, uh, where people say, well, well, sure, there's money laundering in DeFi, but there's money laundering with um, $100 US dollar bills. And, uh, and there's all kinds of terrible stuff that happens in the traditional financial system. So why should we care about the fact that DeFi is allowing tremendous amounts of fraud and illicit activity? It's already there. That, I think, is not terribly helpful because the, the point is it's, it's certainly the case. Um, but that's a failure of regulation. That, that's not a, a reason to uh, uh, abandon even trying to regulate. Um, the question you asked, though, is really the right one, um, which, which I would agree with, which is, um, isn't DeFi potentially something that can be better than the existing system? Not, not just can we uh, reach the level of uh, finance, but, but can we actually improve on it? Um, and, and I would certainly agree with you. There, there are big fundamental problems um, in the structure of the financial system. Uh, and and no, no doubt, um, you know, in particular, these have been highlighted um, with the you know, increase of inequality around the world and, and uh, all of you know, the, the general distrust in institutions um, in, in recent years. Um, but actually, if you go back, I, there's, there's sometimes some slides I use from a guy named Thomas Philippon at, at NYU, who's done longitudinal studies. And, and it turns out that, that basically uh, financial intermediaries have always been powerful, uh, and, and this is you know, his research goes back hundreds of years. Um, and in fact, they have all they have been becoming more powerful over time. The the share of the global economy that is represented in financial services has been going up um, since um, the early 20th century. There was a there was a, a, a substantial drop during uh, the Great Depression. Uh, but but uh, basically, if you take that uh, 10 or 15 years out, it's a straight uh, line up in terms of how powerful financial services are becoming. Um, and that's not a good thing um, because um, you know, it's, it's essentially an intermediary that's a, that's a tax on transactions. Uh, and, and also the political economy is you don't wanna have entities that, that are that powerful in society. So absolutely DeFi could be a corrective. Um, and this is why I'm not suggesting that regulators should regulate to shut it down. I'm saying regulators should regulate to facilitate it being trusted. Um, so um, how do we do that? Well, um, it, it, you know, it gets probably into more of a level of detail than I could give in a, in a quick answer here. Um, but it, it's more about constructing the rules, um, not to assume that you need to, say, require a central actor. It's like what I was talking about below, before with the anti-money laundering. Um, if we can, in a satisfactory way, uh, track suspicious transactions, uh, and verify, for example, that the participants in this system are, are likely to be identified legitimate actors, um, then we may not need to require uh, a, you know, a, a central control point um, in the way that we do in the traditional financial system. Um, you know, and so it actually may be possible for regulation to still allow for a greater degree of decentralization. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, trust is something I, you know, I talk about in the book as confident vulnerability. It's, it's something that you cannot impose. It, it comes from participants being willing to take those risks because they have that level of confidence. And so um, in a, a free, fair competition, a DeFi system that does not have the cost and interference of you know, large intermediaries who are not trusted, um, DeFi is going to win that competition, um, all things being equal. Um, and regulation needs to not get in the way of that happening. So, so again, it's, it's it, what I talk about, the need for regulators to engage more, to be more specific. What, what is an appropriate level of decentralization? They're not going to get that exactly right. Uh, but if they can define that to a point, then that's what allows DeFi um, to get to the point where um, users are going to choose, institutions are going to choose, financial institutions, um, and the DeFi architecture is just better. <laughs> you know, and so so yeah, you'll you'll still have. It's not going to solve all the problems of concentration of power in the world today. No, no question. And there's there's a lot of concentration of power in the crypto world. Um, but 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 there is a fundamental difference in these architectures that that they don't lend themselves to that that central power in the same way. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, very helpful. Um, uh, before we close, are there any other uh, questions at the moment? Excellent. I think uh, all questions have been answered, and um, which uh, I think uh, shows how how uh, clear and and uh, precise your presentation was. So um, that uh, leaves me just to thank you again very much, uh, Kevin, um, that you found the time to to join us uh, for our seminar series, um, and also uh, in in the name of uh, Alex uh, Prada and, and the team, uh, thank you very much.